This business of chirality, having two non-superimposable mirror images, might not seem like a big deal. After all, the difference between those two is really pretty subtle. Yeah, I understand the thought that you wonder whether this is significant or not. Well, let me give you a couple of examples. We'll take a look at some circumstances where chirality pops up, and then maybe you'll be on board with thinking that this is something we really need to pay attention to. Here's a chemical example. If this molecule is treated with the right conditions, you can make a alcohol. And when you do that, you just made a chiral center, a stereogenic center. And these reagents are achiral. And under these conditions, we are going to see that the formation of these two products makes them in equal amounts. Another way to say that is there's a 50-50 mixture. And a third way to say that is it makes a racemic mixture. A racemic mixture is a 50-50 mixture of enantiomers. So, although it's subtle, we made two products. And if we do something with that that involves a chiral reagent of some type or other chiral molecules, we are going to be really surprised about the chemistry we see if we don't remember that there's two products in there. They have absolute stereochemistry, which we can sign, assign. We could call this OH would be priority one. This carbon, which has another carbon, would be priority two. This carbon, which only has hydrogens attached, is priority three. And of course, that hydrogen is priority four. We find that the lowest priority group is away from us. You notice I do that on purpose. Whenever I get a chance, I put that fourth group away from us and we go in a circle from one to two to three. We find ourselves going in a clockwise direction. So this is the R configuration and this will be the S configuration. We have a pair of enantiomers, equal amounts of both, racemic mixture, these are all practically saying the same thing, aren't they? And it will be optically inactive. So even if we use a polarimeter, we will not be able to tell that these are chiral molecules get equal amounts of each. But if this is, finds itself being uh, chemically uh, involved with a chiral reagent, chiral molecules, then all of a sudden it matters a lot that there's two different things. That's a subtle difference, and it only pops up from time to time. For the most part, when we've made a pair of enantiomers, a racemic mixture from achiral starting material and reagents, it doesn't matter much. But now let's take a look at this case. I'm gonna change that molecule just a little bit, and we'll make this a stereogenic center. Let's put a bromine on there and a hydrogen to go along with the methyl in that vinyl group. And now when we do the same chemistry, again, we'll make two products. That bromine is on the wedge. We didn't do anything to that carbon. And let's say the hydroxyl group is on the wedge. And the second one we make has unchanged stereochemistry where the bromine is, but the opposite stereochemistry where the hydroxyl is. So now we've made two products with a chiral molecule not achiral. We used reagents that were achiral, but the fact that they aren't chiral doesn't matter. We're making two products in unequal amounts. If we assign the stereochemistry using the kahn prelog ingold rules with bromine and this carbon and this carbon, and that stereogenic center is R, hydroxyl group, then this carbon with bromine, then the carbon with hydrogens, clockwise, this is R. And this guy over here has the stereo same stereochemistry where bromine is and the opposite stereochemistry here. So these are diastereomers. We've made two products, but they're not enantiomers. They're formed in unequal amounts. The solutions, the product mixture will be optically active. And these guys are two different compounds. They have different melting points, different boiling points, different chemical reactive activities. So these are two distinctly different compounds that are not mirror images. 
And now all of a sudden it's really important to notice that we started with chirality here and we've formed chirality here in the presence of that initial chiral center. Chirality here, new chirality there. We made two diastereomers. These guys will have different solubilities. They'll be separable. They'll have different chemical reactivities. And if we didn't recognize this business about chirality, we'd be terribly puzzled that we have two alcohols, two bromo alcohols, with bromine on the same carbon in each case and a hydroxyl group on the same carbon in each case, but they were behaving really differently. So in the course of chemistry and chemical synthesis, we need to pay close attention to how many stereogenic centers we have, how many we start with, how many we end up with, and it affects a lot of our chemistry. At the same time, you may say, oh, that's okay, but I'm not so impressed. Is it is chirality significant in any other way? And the answer is absolutely. It's huge. Take a look. Most drugs are chiral molecules, and they interact with biological tissues, all of which are chiral. So now we see that we're actually using drugs to accomplish some kind of medical purpose, and that will only happen when the drug interacts with that another chiral molecule, a big chiral molecule, usually with some type of a receptor. It has an odd shape that is chiral. Here's an interesting case. This is ibuprofen, and it has a stereogenic center. The S stereoisomer of ibuprofen fits in the biological receptor and accomplishes that it's a medical effect, which is actually blocking the activity of an enzyme because it fits in a very particular way. While the other enantiomer isn't effective, and it's easy to understand why. Take a look at how the other enantiomer would interact with this same protein. This R stereoisomer can't enter and bind in the same way with this protein and block its activity because it doesn't fit in the site the same way. There's nothing different about this molecule, this ibuprofen, except that I've switched the position of the H and the methyl. And now this small H, which fit just barely in this part of the site, now finds itself in this huge site, which is now mostly empty. And this methyl group, which fit nicely in this larger portion of the receptor site there, now doesn't fit. Our ibuprofen has two problems. It is ineffective because of this large space here. There isn't the binding that normally ibuprofen would have. And much worse, it just flat, flat out doesn't fit physically because of this large methyl group. So our ibuprofen is ineffective, and it's only the S chirality that is active medically. Now when compounds like ibuprofen are synthesized, they're typically synth synthesized as a racemic mixture, a 50-50 mixture of both enantiomers, and that's the case with ibuprofen. So when we buy ibuprofen, we are buying a racemic mixture of the two enantiomers, even though only the S is effective. Now, for many medications, that turns out that that means that what you're buying is only half good, and sometimes the other enantiomer is actually bad. Side effects, bad side effects, often result from having the wrong enantiomer in there. But in ibuprofen is an interesting exception. Take a look at this. The R and S enantiomers are interconverted biologically. So the R is converted into the S, and although in theory this is a reversible reaction, in practice it's the R that's converted to the S. And so when we actually use the racemic mixture of ibuprofen, much of it is used because we use the S enantiomer, and the R enantiomer is converted into the S enantiomer as well. Very interesting. Not common when we Use a racemic mixture for med medical purposes. Usually half of it is what we want and the other half is not, what some, not, not effective and may be harmful. In any case, probably I've convinced you this chirality is a big deal. Almost all biological tissues have chirality associated with them. The chirality that those molecules have is really important.